I'm Peter Whittle. Welcome to this quite special edition of Whittle because it's a very important anniversary tomorrow. It's the 150th anniversary of the birth of Sir Winston Churchill. So who better to talk about that than our very own senior fellow, Rafe Hodomanku, historian, but also uh, quite a specialist actually in Churchill. Rafe, because you were the one of the youngest ever directors, weren't you, of the International Churchill Society? Yes, one of the youngest ever members. I joined as a teenager and then later served on the uh, board of directors of the ICS yeah. and also well, I was an executive member of the Churchill Centre as well, both of which were set up to uh, ensure that the record remained fresh and accurate about Churchill, yeah. in essence to try to combat um, many of the, 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 the myths that have existed actually since the foundation of the centre and the society back in 1968. Was this in Canada? In, both in London and in okay. Canada. It's an international organization, yeah. Washington, D.C., Canada, Toronto, and uh, London, and also in Australia and elsewhere. So you joined as a teenager. Um, the reason I ask is that, you know, in my case, Churchill uh, was unavoidable at home. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, my father was one of those men who absolutely idolized Churchill. So I knew about Churchill, and I kind of knew what it meant. He was like this behemoth of um, history. But what got you... Why Churchill when you were a teenager in your case? I had seen some programs featuring him. I just found his oratory so inspiring. And it was really through the mastery of the English language and almost the, the, the musicality of his speeches and the powerful way in which they were formed that I had me... And also, of course, his iconic image, that bulldog spirit. And it just seems to me, instinctively, it seemed that he personified Britain, patriotism and traditions, all things which even when I was 13, yes. I, was, I, I found very compelling. And the more, of course, you then read about him, uh, the, the more fascinating his life became. I mean, it really was, to quote from you know, Oscar Wilde's reports of being earnest, a life crowded with incident. And uh, just his, you know, the, he, he wrote one of, one of his many sort of biographical pieces, it was called My Early Life. And if any young person wants an introduction to the great man, just to read that, which covers just the first couple of decades of his life and the adventures and the mishaps and everything that happened to him, I mean, that was enough for a lifetime. And then he achieved all of that by the time he was 25 and first entered uh, Parliament in 1900. He'd already been in, in, in four wars by that point. Yes, so he'd been in four wars, but also sort of put himself forward, didn't he, to newspapers at the time. He said, I can cover this for you. I will cover this. And became really quite a a well-known reporter, actually. Indeed, well, he eventually became the world's most uh, highly paid journalist. Uh, this was a man who was convinced of his own destiny. He was, he was absolutely convinced. He's always said, we're all worms, but I'm a glowworm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so that was a bit of humility from him as well, I say, but I'm still a glowworm, even though I'm a worm. And he just expected, when he was a teenager in, uh, at Harrow School, where he was studying, he told one of his friends there that he is destined for greatness. He says, the time will come when I will have to defend London and the empire, uh, prophetically. Uh, he was, uh, you know, his father died in 1895 at the age of 40. His father was a great man, the youngest ever Chancellor of the Exchequer at the age of 37. Yeah. Also a man destined for greatness, um, but he died prematurely. And uh, Churchill therefore felt that he also was going to live a short life so he really was the very definition of a young man in a hurry. Yeah. And so he was determined, you know, his goal had been to enter Parliament at his father's side as a great sort of dynasty. His father died without ever seeing Churchill amount to anything. His father uh, had great disdain and disappointment in his son, which was also a motivating factor for him to actually uh, prove to himself and pro hopefully prove to his father, if his father was looking down, that he had had a life that achieved something. And so he petitioned through his mother, his mother, Jenny Jerome, an, an American heiress who married Lord Randolph. She was very well connected at all levels of British society. And he used every one of her connections to get him posted to any battle anywhere and also to get himself work, not only doing a military role, but also as a correspondent, because he wanted to make sure that he built up his reputation with a view to becoming a politician. Yeah. And of course, it worked perfectly. You know, he was in Cuba fighting in 1895 at the age of 21. Then he went and fought in the Northwest Frontier, uh, where Punjab is against uh, the, the Pashtun was Islam, Islamist extremists. He was one of the first people to really recognize the danger of Mohammedanism, saying that they had a fanatical frenzy about it. And he said that um, 
uh, there is no more retrograde force in the world than Islam. You know, this was in his early 20s, recognized that. He was Mohammedans. Mohammedans, yes, as the term of the time was. Then he went to Sudan, where he helped to fight to end slavery, as something people that accuse him of racism will be well to take note of, and took part in the last great cavalry charge of the British army, the Battle of Omdurman, where he also criticized you know, uh, Lord Kitchener for the bad treatment of the enemy wounded and also for desecrating a Muslim grave as well. So also a man of great sensitivity there. And then, of course, when he went into the Boer War, he became a national hero because even though he was there as a journalist, not, not, not as a soldier, uh, the military armored train he was on got derailed by the Boers and he bravely fought off the Boers. He was captured and then did this dramatic escape from this prisoner of war camp across the country. And this became the stuff of legend back home. So when he arrived back in the UK, he was a national hero. And whereas he had failed the first time to get into Parliament, by the second time as a hero, when he stood for Oldham in 1900, he became uh, he became a member of Parliament and remained so for 63 years. Yes, it, there was a, a film based on my early life called Young Winston, you must know. It came out, I think, about 1970. I remember it very clearly uh, because it was quite a big movie at the time. But there is a... This covers all of these events. And I think as you re refer to there, is that at the very end, he's painting, you know, the old Winston, and the ghost of the father comes and sort of says, so Winston, what did you do with your life? And he says, oh, sold a few paintings, you know. Well, he actually wrote a book about that called The Dream. And it is about this very scene, that's where it came from, that he's painting and the ghost of his father re revisits. Yeah. And he hasn't, he doesn't tell his father that he saved the free world, but that was so important that the shadow of his father loomed large, yeah. as did, as did his mother, because they were both very distant, as you would get in Victorian times. He said of his mother, she shone for me like the evening star. I loved her dearly, but at a distance. Yes. And his live reader was trying to prove to them that he had merit. Yes. Uh, but uh, my goodness, I mean, when I think of my father's admiration, and indeed my admiration, I think a lot of people, Almost aside from his role in, in, the, in, in this country's history, it was the sheer level of activities, you say, in his life, about five lifetimes, surely, in one. You know, literature, soldier, painter, you know, politician, world says. Bricklayer. Bricklayer. <laughs> Bricklayer. It was no end to his. No end to his. These people have been to Chartwell, actually. If you go to Chartwell in Kent, you see, don't you, these walls that he used to just, you know, uh, you know, some of them are a little bit haphazard. But he used to spend his whole time, didn't he, uh, making walls. But yes, I mean, this is the thing. He had such a remarkable, a true Renaissance man. Yeah. Uh, and everything he'd done, you know, he did, he, he went, did with great gusto. He also tried to write fiction as well as one has, you know, but he wrote 37 books, uh, thousands of articles and speeches. Mm -hmm. There's been estimated between 10 and 15 million words that he wrote. As you said, an accomplished painter. He's, you know, his paintings were, were, uh, you know, got great critical acclaim from people who didn't know who the artist was as well. Uh, truly, you know, and learned, you know, could fly a plane <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot, a lot of that stuff was to give him solace during the war. You know, it was a very important mental escape from him, from the, from the, the, the hardship of war to take, to do paintings and so forth. But, uh, it was a, it was a remarkable life. And that's why it's no surprise that the Guinness World Record holder for the world's longest biography, is of Winston Churchill. It's eight volumes and 16 companion volumes. I mean, it's a mammoth yeah. work. Is this the one by Martin Gilbert? Started by, by Churchill's son, Randolph, Gil, uh, Randolph Churchill, and then Sir yeah. Martin Gilbert took it over when uh, Randolph died in 1968. And then Sir Martin died, and it's been taken over by the by Hillsdale College, uh, by Dr. Larry Arne, who we had just had on our show recently, mm -hmm. and then Richard Langworth, who's probably the, the world's leading expert on Churchill, uh, also at Hillsdale. Yes, but we knew you say you 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 loved his oratory as a uh, as a teenager. So presumably, from that one can say he inspired you. Absolutely. I mean, if, if he wrote in a very old fashioned way, even for the standards of the time, and he really was a 
a, a war speaker, if I can put it that way, because the sort of speeches he gave were designed for war and often didn't fit in other circumstances. So if you were speaking about trade policy, you would find him using similar phrases, just dealing with, you know, people, you know, our competitors, you know, on the, on the global trade, trading world, uh, rather than, you know, the, the, the foe that's mm. there. Mm. But um, he spoke in very plain English. And these are sort of the lessons that the politicians and others of today, the pontificators and commentators, who use very long words, he said, oh, short words are best and old words are best of all. Uh, he preferred, said, always use Anglo-Saxon words, never use the French words, you know. Unfortunately, there's no Anglo-Saxon word for surrender. That's a... <laughs> but, uh, you know, so you get, give us the tools yeah. and we will finish the job. That sort of thing. And there was also a lyricism to his speech. He wrote them all as if they're poetry, the verse. And, the, the, you know, he was a master of, 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 of um, the rhetorical device. And uh, he, he learned this from an American called, uh, called Burke, who was inspired him on this speeching style. But even when you hear the way that he speaks, in a sentence, you'll get the long words first, and then you'll get the shorter words at the end for added effect. So it was, um, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And but in the lyricism, you know, when he was talking about the uh, America and Britain becoming closer, he said, nothing can stop it like the Mississippi, let it roll on, let it roll on, let it roll on full flood, inexorably, irresistibly benignant to broader lands and better days. And there's just a natural rhythm to it all, which is very infectious. Yes. I, b I believe that Orwell, actually, I, I'm not sure of the book, it might have been the Second World War book, but... Uh, or was asked of his opinion of the book, and he said, uh, it's the work of a human being, which I think uh, sums it up, Ray, as you said, a kind of sense of coming straight from him, straight from the heart. Of course, Orwell also famously wrote an essay about the importance of English. Mm -hmm. He said, never say utilize when you mm -hmm. can say use. There's no need to say utilize ever. And I always try to make sure that you do say things like that because you're trying to convey messages and information to the public. And uh, the, the most effective way to do it is always use short words and Anglo-Saxon words. You mentioned he's speaking, uh, though, but um, you know, he didn't just spontaneously stand up and do it, did he? I mean, it was very, very, you know, researched and very practiced. I think it was, was it not one bad experience when he was young? That's right. He was speaking on the floor of the House of Commons and he completely froze. He had a mental blank. And um, he was determined, it was, he was so humiliated by that, he was determined yeah. never to have that again. He wrote all of his speeches, remember that. So all of these great speeches weren't written by a team of speech writers as today, everyone writes their speeches today. And he would meticulously rehearse and recite them, pacing up and down in Chartwell, memorizing all of these, so that when he did deliver them, they would seem to be coming off the cuff. Because of course, everyone thinks of Chedgel's being the great wit, right? But it was very practice, a lot of it. Yes, when he was at dinner parties, he could come out with some wonderful retorts and reposts. Uh, but, uh, you know, but Bessie Braddock, when she's one of the first female MP, um, she said, uh, Winston, you're disgustingly drunk. He says, yes, Bessie, but you're disgustingly ugly. And in the morning, I will be sober. You'll still be disgustingly ugly. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing was great. Um, but yes, but, but, and, and it's difficult because unfortunately we didn't have recordings in the House of Commons at those times. So, so some, the, the, the electricity on the floor of the House of Commons in 1940, when he was delivering some of the finest speeches ever written, we will never have that because when you listen to the recordings of him today, these were made after the Second World War by, I think it was Decca Records. Mm. And it's Churchill in a recording studio as an old man simply reading these speeches. Now, there's no water fight, and so you lose a lot of the passion. And so some of the speeches can sound quite monotonous when he speaks them because it's a very different environment to being there in the charged floor of the House of Commons. I, we're talking about him. Um, actually, yes, uh, Ollie, you can put up a picture now, actually. This is the the kind of iconic picture, um, you know, of him by Karsh of Ottawa, uh, which is this, everyone knows this image. Um, and I think that what is one of the most important questions about Churchill, because we're talking about him in this iconic way at the moment, is, and I would I'd really like to know what you're saying. If we had, if there had not been 1940, right, because Let's take the bit up there. Would he just be regarded now as a very interesting failure? 
precisely. That, that's the way to describe it. He would have had a remarkable life, uh, but doomed to the same failure as his as his father mm. as his father was. Uh, it was that year. I mean, there are many reasons why Churchill was a great leader, um, but the the key thing is, you know, there are very few moments in in world history where the phrase "cometh the hour, cometh the man." was more appropriate. And I don't think there was ever a case in world history when the future of a civilization rested briefly upon one man's shoulders. And that's what happened uh, between um, May 1940 and June 1940 with the invasion of France and the, and the uh, Dunkirk, all the way through to June 1941, Operation Barbarossa, when Hitler invaded Russia. Because for that one year, Britain stood alone. And when I say Britain stood alone, I do understand the Canadians and the Australians and the Commonwealth and the Empire was there, Poland and the Czechs were still fighting, but they had their lands had been conquered. The Polish government and the, the, the French government were in Britain. Britain as an island stood alone in the continent of Europe. And if Britain had gone down, the Axis powers would have controlled Europe, Russia, Asia, Africa, and Austra Australasia. And I say Russia because, uh, you know, Stalin and Khrushchev both uh, agreed and said after the war that if Britain had gone down, Hitler would have been able to conquer Russia because mm -hmm. he only applied 70% of his forces against, against the Soviet Union. And they said if he had actually directed 100% of his forces against the Soviet Union, then we would have gone down. Mm -hmm. And that meant that the entire world, apart from the Americas, would have been under the control of, of the Axis powers, including Japan and Asia, of course. And then you're in a different world entirely. Some people say, well, you know, uh, because of obviously the, the, the British, British scientists were also involved in the Manhattan Project in America as well. So then, you know, <laughs> there's, there's every possibility that Germany would have developed the atomic bomb before the Americans did because they relied so much on, on, on British tube alloy experts. And so even the Americans would have been living at the point of a gun and world history would have been an entirely different thing altogether. So for that one year, it was only Churchill's iron-willed, resolute determination that kept Britain in the war effort, because if you had had somebody else as prime minister at that time, say Lord Halifax, mm -hmm. called, often called Holy Fox, um, it seems quite obvious to me that he would have sued for peace. And the problem there, of course, is that Hitler tore up every single peace treaty he'd ever signed. Mm -hmm. You know, he went into the Rhineland, he went into the Sudetenland, he tore up the Munich Agreement and went and got all of Czechoslovakia. He then tore up the uh, Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact not to invade Russia. Every peace treaty he had, he signed up. Britain and France knew this. That's why when you know Hitler made peace offerings to France and, and Britain, they knew why that was. He, Hitler couldn't get domination over the air over Britain. He wanted to force to, you know, he stupidly believed he could take out Russia in a matter of yeah. days, knock Russia out of the war, one of the great eras of world history, <laughs> military history, and then coalesce your forces and direct everything against Britain and so forth. And, you know, Churchill kept that flame of freedom flickering for that one year until we get the miracles of Russian involvement and then, of course, American involvement in the Second World War, which turned the tide and essentially signed the death warrant for Hitler. But for those months, you know, when resources were so slender, Britain had no means of really doing anything but just resisting, yes. Churchill's speeches and his d decisiveness in uh, refusing, to be in t refusing to have defeatism mm. uh, in the British government kept that flame of freedom alive. And I think all the peoples of, of Western Europe and especially of Jewry and so forth should be grateful for that. Yes. Um, you mentioned obviously America coming into the war there. Uh, he was obviously, in, in, he was half American actually, wasn't he? And I've, I'm, my feeling of Churchill is that he was you know, born in Blending Palace, born of an aristocratic um, dynasty, uh, but he was, what do you say, he wasn't of them. It's a bit like the uh, same with his the political party, the Tory party. He wasn't sort of of them. He kind of transcended those things. You, do you know what I mean? It's that like Halifax, Lord Halifax, was of them. The Churchill was somehow... He always had maverick spirit. As I said, half American, half British. There was, the, there was a myth. It's not true, but the Jerome family, his mother, I mean, liked to say that they had some Iroquois blood in there, which he used to relish the possibility. He descended from the yeah. Iroquois. Not true. You know, in fact, that when he went to Congress, he said, you know, I can't help but reflect that if my 
if my um, mother had been American, if my, if my mother had been British and my father American, and so the other way around, I would have ended up here on my own in, Cong in Congress. But it was that feeling that he actually did, you know, he was more of an Anglosphere person than uh, perhaps anybody else in Parliament at that time. He was a maverick spirit. Uh, he was very much, in essence, somebody who uh, did, uh, in fact, was seen as a class traitor for a long time. You must remember, yeah. he became a member of the Liberal Party with David Lloyd George. And whereas everyone today thinks of him as some sort of stuffy patriarchal t Tory, he was one of the founders of the welfare state. You know, this was a man who uh, created the first labor exchanges, uh, 200, the modern version of job centers, started the unemployment insurance. He uh, passed the um, uh, eight-hour miners bill, saying miners could only go and work in mines for eight hours. The Board of Trade bill, which essentially uh, set a minimum wage. He set the minimum wage in the country, stopped exploitative employers. Uh, he also reduced prison numbers, and he reduced the number of hours that prisoners could be in solitary confinement. So, uh, and at that time, all, all these things, which today seem pretty obvious, yeah. were controversial for for for, for the the upper the upper classes. Although, actually, uh, you know, we can we come on to these kind of attacks on Churchill um, now, but um, you know, he was sort of on the wrong side of perceived wisdom, wasn't he, in the thirties on certain things, like whether it was he abdication he was part of a king's party if you like wasn't he and that might have been out of romanticism do you think or what he was a great romantic you know he was far closer to the uh, 18th century dandy than he was to the 19th century victorian i mean he would openly weep you know this is a person who would cry at you know watching a cheap movie or it would be the reception of the crowds or when he was learning of the horrors of what was happening in the second world war you could, it's difficult to imagine Vic, you know, his father or Victorian doing that, but you know, Lord Nelson was weeping as well, very much. And Lord Nelson was one of his great idols, and you know, in life, uh, so he was a great romantic. But he, of course, there are many reasons you can criticize Churchill. There are many valid criticisms you can make about Churchill. Churchill on India, Churchill as Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, tying Britain to the gold standard. You've got the abdication crisis of, of, of Edward VIII. You've got the Dardanelles campaign in the First World War in, in, in Gallipoli. Uh, so there are, there are lots of, the, even the bombing of Dresden, you could put there too. There are lots of legitimate criticisms. But unfortunately, the criticisms we hear today are completely baseless. No serious historian makes the arguments that you get here. You hear from from BLM to the, to the far left, and also increasingly from the far right about Churchill. Those have no uh, basis in his in historical fact. Yes, I mean there, those those failures and such like that you just mentioned. There, uh, I suppose that's really what I meant when I said he he might have been in a, a fascinating failure. Um, you, what you're talking about now? I mean these criticisms. Um, most recently, we've had this, what, frankly, Rafe, it seems like a complete non-entity of a historian, seems to me. I'd never heard of him. Uh, Daryl Cooper um, pretty much was saying he was the villain of World War II. It's hard even to take that sort of thing seriously, isn't it? Well, if, you're, if you are calling Churchill the, uh, the, the villain of World War II, you've gone down a very dark rabbit hole indeed, I think. I mean, it, it, it doesn't even deserve, it doesn't... De deserve addressing you know, you know Daryl Cooper is not a recognized historian mm. none of the serious historians of Churchill you know, Andrew Roberts or Neil Ferguson you know people who are on the right like Vic Victor Davis Hansen they've all debunked his claims I've debunked debunked his his claims as well I um, mean you know, for some reason Tucker Carlson called him one one of our greatest historians who's man's never written a book in his life nobody knows of him apart from in certain, certain areas of the internet and so forth but there are, you know, but it's not just Daryl Cooper, you know, in, in India now, there are lots of these uh, journalists posing as historians who've written these potted histories, uh, accusing Churchill of the Bengal famine, for example. What is, just can you clarify, you know, the general attitude to India and indeed the Bengal famine? What, <clears throat> is it, was Churchill blame this? You know, because this is always brought up now, isn't it? Whenever Churchill comes up, People want to discredit him. It's poor. So the, the Bengal fa famine, where over, over a million people died, was due, due to a cyclone that hit Bengal during the during the Second World War, um, was never cited as something that Churchill was responsible for until the last few decades. So it's only been recently that this has come up. And this was because of a badly written book by a woman called Mukherjee, I think it was called, in Churchill's Secret. And... Um, 
She made all of these crazy claims in this book, and then the the leading Indian expert on famines completely destroyed it. An Indian chap and said all the she's using she's, she's using data from two little areas. You can't do it. You can't write a book based upon this sort of thing. Essentially, the argument is that Churchill uh, didn't give food to the, the to Bengal and divert, in fact diverted food away from Bengal. And in fact, they were exporting grain and so forth out of Bengal. I mean, this is this is nonsense. The fact is, firstly, Britain was fighting for its life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Britain was, you know, in the, heavily engaged in the Second World War. By this point, they were actually. Um, preparing the getting more mobilized for the d-day landings as well um there were food food rationing was in britain you had peoples in in, in greece and elsewhere also starving and in, in, in southern europe um and yet despite all of that churchill did what he could to get grain there he got a million tons of grain there much of it from australia he was appealing to the americans to the canadians to the australians to help managed to get a million tons there he wanted to send more he wanted more ships but the royal navy and the americans said we can't because we, we we're going to do the d-day landings we need to ensure we have our, our our fleet there the issue with the bengal famine was quite simply issues happening in bengal and around it firstly in the old days when you had a, a cyclone or a famine you would bring in grain from externally unfortunately the japanese were were external so the japanese were blockading the area and you there was no way of passing uh, food supplies through secondly you had indian traders who were stockpiling grain in order to make a profit on of it and, and raise the price and so that you had huge amounts of grain there that simply weren't being distributed then you had incompetence in terms of the local local regional administrators who didn't know how to deal with the famine and there was just incompetence there and that was done by, by by the british empire i mean these are british administrators who didn't know what they were doing either and then you had the viceroy as well who was too slow to act but to blame all of this upon a 67-year-old man in Britain <laughs> who is trying his best to fight a war, I mean, it's completely absurd. And, you know, Churchill, you know, there are many, there are many causes of the famine. Churchill wasn't one of them. No. Well, they, 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 this is a stick which is used now to beat him with by the usual suspect. I mean, obviously, the reason I mention that is that over the past, what is it now? I say, what, four or five years, um, since the Black Lives Matter thing, but essentially, you know, we've had this assault on our history. We discuss it all the time, don't we, on the channel. But it seems that Churchill is an absolutely emblematic of that, therefore has to be destroyed. Wouldn't you say? Well, think about who whose statues are being attacked and who, what's being renamed. It's Churchill, it's mm. Nelson, it's Drake, it's the great Elizabeth I. The characters that symbolize the British spirit and the maverick nature of the British spirit. And uh, what is the great, the, the best way that you can demoralize a society is by attacking and denigrating their heroes, by rewriting their history, and by disconnecting a people from their culture and their past. And all societies, all civilizations, all cultures need heroes, people to aspire to be to be inspired by. Um, you know, all heroes have feet of clay eventually, but there is there is something about having inspirational figures because that, in, a, in essence, creates a sense of national identity. Wherever you go in the world, there are figures who, in a sense, forge a national identity. So there's no surprise that when Britain is under attack, uh, our hero is under attack. And with Churchill, of course, you know, the, the biggest sledgehammer of today is racism, right? The racism sledgehammer. Was Churchill a racist? Well, did he believe that white people were superior on the pecking order? Absolutely. Just as anybody else from that era would have done, you know? I'm sure in a hundred years from now, people will look at our attitudes and say that in whatever way we can't possibly imagine, that we were somehow a retrograde. Yes, yeah. Um, but the fact was, he was born into a Darwinian age when people did mean it. It was quite seriously believed that there was a hierarchy of the races, whether you, you know, as, as reprehensible as that is, that was the prevailing view of the time. But for Churchill, the idea was, with that status comes responsibility and there was a duty to you know to civilize the world and to to bring the world the benefits of the west to the rest of the world through medicine and infrastructure and government and civil service and you know get, spread the blessings wider still but remember as i said churchill fought in sudan to end slavery he in south africa he debated for the rights of black people against the boers uh in in south africa also mahatma gandhi who was also you could say racist towards black people mahatma gandhi thanked churchill for defending the rights of indians 
um, in, in South Africa. During the Northwest Frontier, he was fighting to de defend the Punjabis against radical Islam and was fighting alongside the Sikhs. Yeah. And when one of his Sikh, fellow Sikh soldiers was wounded, he risked his life with another chap to drag the Sikh person, the Sikh soldier, to, to safety. Uh, in fact, during the American segregation, uh, when American troops landed here from America, the American army wanted to continue segregation over here. and They wanted to, they had to have them separated. And Churchill famously said, oh, actually, well, not so famously, because I don't think enough people know about it, but he said, we will not support segregationism here. You know, black and black troops have every right to access every, any single canteen or shop or play uh, or whatever facility. Uh, we, won't, we won't enforce any of that here. Now, when it comes to India, things are slightly more complicated because he is on record as having said some very nasty things about Indians. But what's important to remember first and foremost is Churchill never used any racial epithets. Right. He never used the N-word. He never used these, these slurs and all the millions of words that we have about him. There's no record of him using that. Contrast that with Marx, a beloved of the left, who used the N-word every second page, it seemed like, and was, as did Engels, both hugely racist. Uh, the thing was, all of the bad things said about India uh, emanate primarily from the records and diaries of Leo Amory, who was an old friend of Churchill. They were in the war cabinet, and Churchill had a mischievous side to him, and he knew how to rile up Leo Amory, and they had this sort of ongoing uh, feud for a long time. And so Churchill would say things in cabinet about, about Indians, who he was very angry with because they were essentially support many of them were nationalists were supporting the Nazis. And so, there's, you know, the things he said were said out of exasperation at the way that the, he, he, uh, the many Indian nationalists were actually working against the British Empire during the Second World War. And knowing Leo Amory's reaction, he would say things perhaps, which he wouldn't, not knowing that they will be recorded for posterity behind closed door. But the, and so it's, it's only really Amory's. And Amory, of course, had a very foul mouth on him as, as well yeah, yeah. with all of this. But, you know, towards the, uh, you know, towards the end of his premiership, he said to an Indian politician, I want to see India take its rightful place as a dominion next to Canada and Australia and so forth. So his great... His great thing was with Indian politicians and also with the Indian caste system, which he also found very destructive. And so when you view his comments in, the, in those contexts, and I think it, you know, he comes off a lot fairer, but of course he did hold traditional views. The interesting thing is about Churchill, he was a man of empire and he famously said, you know, if the British Empire were to last a thousand years, this was their finest hour. But um, actually he ended up overseeing the disintegration of the empire, didn't he? That was the greatest tra tragedy for him, mm. um, because as you said, he didn't want to, s to see the end of the empire. Um, but unfortunately, Britain was exhausted after the Second World War. Now that has led many on, on the right to say that Britain shouldn't have fought the Second World War. But of course, the reality is, if Britain had sued for peace with Hitler, then Britain would have been living at the point of a gun next to a schizophrenic. And the idea that Britain could have continued to live peacefully next to this behemoth power, Britain was always going to be at threat. You know, Britain's standard diplomatic policy had been to keep, maintain the balance of power in Europe. You know, if, if, if Germany had been allowed to, to continue to have its Leib Lebensraum, expand itself and then conquer Russia, I mean, it would be by far the dominant force in Europe. And of course, you have to remember, Hitler had a messianic complex. Napoleon was always in the back of his mind, you know. When he conquered France, he went to Paris, he went to the Pantheon, and he stood over Napoleon's grave, and he said that was the finest moment of his life. Yeah. And so people forget about that. They forget that this was a man who saw himself in the same category as Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and Napoleon. And Napoleon was never able to conquer Russia. Napoleon couldn't conquer Britain. Hitler absolutely would have done that to secure his, his global legacy. So, of course, it did lead to, to the liquidation of the empire, although that would have happened inevitably. You know, it was certainly stopped by a few decades, I would, have, I would have said. But also, for those who say that Churchill shouldn't have gone into the war because we lost the empire, well, what would that have meant for the peoples of Europe? Mm -hmm. What would that have, you know, would we have just sat by watching the mass extermination of an entire race? watching the enslavement of the, the Slavs, the Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians themselves, li being liquidated. I mean, the empire w may not have been liquidated, but pe millions of people would have been liquidated on the continent. Could we have, in, in good conscience, have lived with all of that? The thing is, it's, it's also arguing the wrong point. 
isn't it? It's like, you know, that wasn't the reason for going into the war. I mean, it was a territorial thing. You're defending your territory. Um, it's not actually about, okay, that was one of the, that, ex as you say, exhausted us, that led to the empire going, but that wasn't the reason. But also, critically important, if Britain had listened to Churchill in the 1930s, then the empire would not have been liquidated because Churchill had been warning. He was one of the early voices, but the first prominent voice to warn about the rise of Nazism and the rise of Hitler. And he always had a policy for, so ever since the First World War when he built up the British Navy, because he also foresaw the rise of, of, of the Kaiser as a threat maintain the strongest military possible, the yeah. armaments, you know, that's how you stop war. You stop war by showing, into, you know, something the West could have looked, could still learn today, show your strength, be confident and assertive, and the, the bullies will back down. And it was the failure of Britain to actually rearm Chamberlain's with, to our Air Force and our Navy and so forth. Well, the Navy was still the biggest in the world, but could have been stronger, the Air Force and the military. That was why, the you know, Hitler felt emboldened to carry on as he did. And so, remember, Churchill wasn't prime minister when the war broke out. He became prime minister on May the 10th, 1940. So had Churchill been in power earlier, then he, he may not even have had the Second World War. Yes, yes. Well, after the war, of course, it was a, and he was thrown out in that last life of labor. What was it? I, I think his wife said, didn't she, Clementine? Uh, it's the best thing in disguise. And he said, oh, it's very well disguised at the moment. Yes. I mean, what, what was his attitude? Well, yes. I mean, uh, yeah, King George the Sixth, the father of Prince the Second, uh, after uh, Churchill was kicked out of office, he said, uh, he wanted to give him the Order of the Garter. And Churchill said, I can hardly accept the Order of the Garter from His Majesty when his people have just given me the Order of the Boot. Um, he was deeply hurt by that. Um, but of course, again, they weren't kicking out Churchill. They were kicking out the Tories. Mm. They loved Churchill. He was the great hero. But remember, the Tories had been in power for a huge amount of time before 1945. They still needed to be blamed for appeasement. Mm. It was appeasement was a Tory thing. And that's what people were remembering. They, well, there was also a feeling perhaps that Churchill, well, the, the, the campaign, the Tory campaign for, for 1945 focused on Churchill, the war hero, to the exclusion of Churchill, the reformer pointing out all the things I told you about the welfare system he had created. And people were too concerned that he might be too focused on foreign affairs when in after the, they wanted the 45 government to focus on rebuilding Britain. Yeah. And that's what Labour and Attlee were offering them. Um, and of course, then you did get, you know, Churchill said, well, you can't have a socialist state without some form of Gestapo. And that did a lot of damage to him. Although today, we might perhaps say that he was actually quite prescient, just a few decades too early and all of that, which is another point, you know, Churchill's foresight. This was a man who saw the rise of radical Islam when he was 25. This was a man who saw the, the clouds of war looming over uh, Europe in 19, in, before the First World War, prepared the Navy for that. We had the best prepared Navy when he was first order of the Admiralty. This was the man from the 30s, his years in the wilderness, warning about Hitler, constantly getting secret information from Leak from Silver about Germany's rearmament of planes. And this was the man who immediately upon the end of the war coined that great phrase, you know, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Churchill was the first person to understand the threat that the Soviet Union and Stalin posed to the West. In fact, what people don't realize, I think, is, is that because a lot of people say, well, he went into bed with Stalin. You know, when, when uh, Hitler invaded Russia, Churchill said on the floor of the House of Commons, if Hitler invaded hell, I would make a favorable reference to the devil yeah. in the House of Commons. And the first thing he wanted to do once Germany had been vanquished is launch Operation Unthinkable, which was actually to get all of the allied forces in Europe to carry on the war but turn it against Russia, to push Russia out of Poland, out of Central Europe, to its own borders. And he desperately wanted the Americans to come in on that, but the Americans were essentially mm -hmm. saying, look, we're, we're, uh, we're exhausted, we'll never get the political support for doing something so radical, because they didn't see Stalin in those terms. But just think about how the post-war world would have been different if there had been no Iron Curtain and those countries had been free democracies in Central and Eastern Europe. So that's just one of the many ways in which he was actually uh, one, the greatest man of the 20th century. Well, I, I would say that, but, you know, right, I Probably up to this century, his shadow has basically loomed over all party politics. It's always, well, what would Winston have done? 
or what would Churchill or what would Churchill think now if he came back? All of that. It, 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 it's very, very clear. Um, there's one issue as well where <clears throat> he was in, evoked by um, both sides, which was the Brexit debate. What actually was his agit? What actually was his? What was he proposing for Europe? Churchill never saw Britain as part of Europe, and this is where so much confusion yeah. reigns. He was for a United States of Europe because he saw the, the two greatest calamities of world history had been the First World War and the Second World War, both of which happened within 20 years of each other. And so he certainly thought that the, the French and the Germans and the Italians, and uh, uh, there should be some way to bring these countries together, you know, still respecting their sovereignty, but, but having some way by which you can, well, you, you, can, you can essentially um, ensure that you don't have another cataclysmic uh, in, uh, escalation of military and hostilities against each other. But that was not Britain's role. No. He saw Britain in terms of the Anglosphere. He saw an Anglo-American future. He saw a future of Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and America. Remember, he wrote that great history of the English-speaking peoples. He didn't consider himself a European by any stretch. You know, Britain was, you know, after it lost a lot of its power, he saw Britain as being that vital conduit between America and Europe, being able to perform that role. And so he said in, 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 you know, famously in his speeches that we are, we are interested in Europe, but we are not of Europe. Of it. And that's the thing people should understand because I think they confuse those two things. Mm. This is real speculation, but I mean, counterfactuals can be quite, um, quite fun in some ways. But if you take the two strains in the Tory party, what I would call the traditional one, which broadly speaking, I suppose we're part of, which is you believe in tradition. And then you've got the kind of free market evangelic, evangelicals. Um, where would he have lined up instinctively? And absolutely with it, with the traditionalists. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. He was, you know, he was the 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 Roger Scruton, Roger Scruton type of of of, uh, of, of Tory. Mm -hmm. He was he believed that the conservatism was about conservation. The clue is in the name, you know. Whereas a type of free marketeers, those are neoliberals. They are by no stretch are they actually um, conservative. He was an unapologetic high Tory. He was a romantic, and he was in his idea of of history and policy his idea of history the heritage of this country the greatness of this country yes. and of its peoples infused all of his thinking was he actually even that interested in economics well you know it's funny because he, he held 12 cabinet offices every great office of state except for foreign secretary which is strange because he would have been good yeah, there yeah. but he was chancellor of the exchequer and he wasn't a very good chancellor of the exchequer uh, and he didn't know. He never had any great uh, abilities or skills in that regard. You know, as you know, he famously didn't go to university, so he didn't study PPE like <laughs> anyone today did. Uh, he was an autodidact, so he did his own studying when he went uh, to India and he was in the army and he would read the great books in the tents. But he always had a, a chip on his shoulder that he didn't really know that much about things like economics and the subjects other people studied at university. And, but so, uh, yeah, so, yeah. But I think that there are... There are lessons for people almost at every stage of their lives in Churchill's life, whether it's not going to university, right up to thinking at 67, the man becomes, you know, the essentially what goes up to a different level of statesmanship, comes leader of the country. So, you know, basically, I think that should it always gives people hope, should always give people hope and inspiration. In the 1950s, when he was, um, uh, well, he was just retiring. So 1954, I believe. Famously, there was a painting, I think we're going to show it all here, actually. Here it is, yes. Uh, which was done, I actually think it's a great painting, but anyway, um, Graham Sutherland at the time did it. But Churchill hated it, didn't he? And it disappeared. Yes. So this portrait was a gift of the combined Houses of Parliament, and it yeah. was presented to Churchill at a great ceremony in Westminster Hall, and um, everybody was excited for this great unveiling. And then the uh, portable was, was on an easel. The, cur the, the curtain on the painting came down and there were audible gasps from everybody attended there because, you know, in Churchill's understanding, it was painted in sickly greens and yellows. Uh, he'd look he was as if he was 120. There was the, the suggestion of a fly button undone as far as, as, far as his wife was concerned. And he was visibly hurt by it. And his, but in typical Tertullian style, he looked at it and he said, 
the portrait uh, is a remarkable example of modern art. <laughs> so, um, but then, you know, she could, uh, Clementine could see how hurt she was, and they, they took it back to Chartwell, and they, 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 as far as I know, they burnt it on the fire. And, and That's right, yes. It, 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 all that exists now are sketches, I would say. Um, tell me, Rafe, like, uh, tomorrow, 150th uh, anniversary, or you might actually be watching this today, uh, this Saturday, um, the 30th of November. Um, what would, should people do for two things, really? What book do you think they should read, if they're going to read one? And also, for that matter, out of all the kind of different portrayals that there have been, which do you think gets nearest to him? So let's start with the book. What what book would you say, yes, I'd read that if you want to know more? Sure. Well, before I say that, I just also want to say, you said people can learn from his life. Yes. They can also learn from his character. If you want to succeed in life, Churchill's characteristics, you know, his uh, his resilience, wherever things get you down, you know, and... Not, nobody in the world had experienced more uh, than he did, you know, his, 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 but his optimism all throughout it mm -hmm. and his infectious ability to actually, um, everyone loved to be around him because they felt yeah. so much better. Even during the Second World War, he gave them hope. Uh, so there are so many of those great qualities that he had of, of inspiring people and being, and being someone who was doggedly determined to pursue their, their destiny in life and their goal and do whatever you can to achieve that. So as a leader, there's so much also people can learn from him if they read about his life but in terms of books so it, if you want to, to uh, learn the, the best book to introduction to Churchill from himself it would be my early life his own sort of fabulous history of his first early years in terms of biographies written about him the the standout biography is um, by Andrew Roberts quite recent quite recent book I happen to be in the acknowledgements which I'm very happy to be about it too um, that's a very good book also uh, Martin Gilbert wrote a very good one volume Churchill uh, Life um, and there's also a three volume but much more sort of like it reads like a work of like a novel William Manchester's The Last Line also very 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 good piece piece to read um, and then what you were asked about film. Films, and what portrayals, you know, drama, because it's TV, it's been some pretty good ones. So the, the very best uh, uh, program to watch is actually uh, by, with Robert Hardy. It's mm -hmm. called The Wilderness Years, right. and it recovers basically the entire, uh, from the great Wall Street crash of 1929 mm -hmm. up until he becomes prime minister. And it's a multi-part series filmed in the 80s, but on ITV, wonderful portrayal by, by Robert Hardy, who uh, was, was a great, great actor. Um, and there are some superb films. I mean, you know, the the best portrayal of Churchill I've ever seen was Gary Oldham. That's interesting. Uh, Gary, Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah. In uh, in in the the, uh, the darkest hour, yeah. uh, it was such a remarkable portrayal of him physically. In terms of uh, that's the closest I've ever seen anyone get to. Uh, uh, Albert Finney wasn't bad. There was another film called The Gathering Storm in which he appears. That's very good. Richard Burton for the centenary did another film called The Gathering Storm. All of these. There's a there's a lot of, out, of stuff out there which is great. Also, Simon Ward as a young Churchill yes. in that film too. So there's no shortage of, of films worst portrayal i would have to say <laughs> is uh, there are two contenders for that one is timothy spore at the london olympic ceremony he was uh, did a, a obnoxious impersonation of churchill and then there was the in the crown people thought he was a very good actor oh, john, Lis john lithgow Yes, and I think he was so hammed up. It was a, it was more of a pantomime, Churchill. Yes, I agree with you about Gary, Gary Oldman. Actually, I had, there were a couple of things in the film which were weren't quite right. It was a little bit wokeified in some ways, but then you almost have to accept that now. But so so basically, you'd say that uh, Robert Hardy would be for someone who just wants to find out more. Yeah, Robert, the Robert Hardy. Yes, and nobody was more of a Churchillian than Robert Hardy. He was a great friend of the family and dedicated uh, so much of his time to Churchill performances. I mean, uh, uh, by way of ending, uh, Rafe, we, we, um, we've talked a bit about the criticism of him, but I'm, I'm glad we haven't actually, or the, or the kind of the besmirching of him, but we shouldn't take too much time over them, I think, because uh, they get enough time as it is. But um, you, wrote our, you wrote our chapter in the book, State of Emergency, about a proper patriotic education in schools. Well, half of the problem of this criticism with Churchill is that people don't know, particularly young people. So he should be reinstated entirely. Shouldn't he just be almost like a module? 
I would like to see that of an educational, uh, would you say? Oh, yes, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is one of the great tragedies is the fact that um, a quarter of, of um, children in this country um, think that Churchill is a fictional character like Sherlock Holmes. And I think something like yeah. half of them, half of kids can't identify a picture of Churchill and say that was our mm -hmm. Second World War leader. So when you have such ignorance, it's so easy then for bad actors, bad faith carried people to cast all sorts of calumnies on, on Churchill. Because if you don't even know who the man is and you've got, you're not um, skilled, you don't have the knowledge base to actually determine what is bad history, you'll believe the nonsense that's coming out. And, I'm, and it doesn't just apply to young people, I'm afraid. You know, the, the you know, people in this country stop learning history at the age of 14, whereas it's 16 in most countries in Europe. And so, unfortunately, we have a largely historically ignorant population out there particularly amongst the younger generations. And that's one of the main reasons why they are being hoodwinked by a lot of this bad fake history that, that is out there. So we need to change the curriculum. We need to teach history in a chronological fashion. We don't need it to be jingoistic, but it must be patriotic in the sense that he shouldn't be afraid to celebrate the good stuff because, my God, they're taught about all the bad stuff. And we're not saying don't teach the bad stuff because history does have, but you need to have a balanced history. And unfortunately, for too long, the pendulum has swung in one direction. And one of the best ways you can teach people about a love of history and the, and then the great man of history theory is through the life of Winston Churchill, greatest Britain of all time, greatest man of the 20th century. And also, yes, uh, he was actually uh, voted, wasn't he, Greatest Britain by the BBC poll 2000. I think he probably still would be the greatest well, even now. Because I was part of that 2002 campaign. I was with Mo Modem for the final in, at the BBC. There were 10 candidates, Isambar Kinder Brunel, Jeremy Clarkson, Portilla Elizabeth I, uh, and, uh, and Mo Modem had Churchill. And I don't know now whether that would be the, whether he would win. And that just goes to show you how quickly our society has changed within the space of one generation, because a generation is 25 years. Within that span, there have been so many attacks now. And I think I do recall some polling actually showing how far support for Churchill has fallen. I can't quote the figures now, but it's very depressing. But uh, let's hope that there will be a, a rebirth and a rejuvenation of interest in him through things like his 150th anniversary. The Royal Mail have put out a nice range of stamps, and so the people are still interested. Yes, and uh, well, we've sort of got to ensure that this happens, haven't we? You've got to make sure that he stays there. Uh, Ray, thanks so much. That was fascinating stuff. So tomorrow is the anniversary. I keep saying it. You might be watching Saturday, 30th of November. And uh, remember those tips for where you can find out more. Um, but anyway, um, here's to Churchill. And uh, we shall see you next time. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.